Congress back in town, the news is certainly breaking. Eisenhower has finally decided that he has to get his program through con Congress at any cost, and here are the developments. He has finally picked a successor to Senator Taft. And the man he has picked is none other than the Vice President, Mr. Nixon, who a year ago, his name was Mutt. But today, he's the white-haired boy around the White House. Now, this naturally is going to cause some trouble with the Senate Majority Leader, Mr. Noland of California. Because both of these men are young, both are ambitious, and both aspire to be President of the United States. So it's a safe prediction that Nolan is going to kick over the traces. In fact, he has already done so. Now, inside the White House, at the very secret conference with the Democrats last week, the thing that Eisenhower emphasized most was that we are going to reduce the army and rely on atomic bombs. The big land army of the United States is going to be cut one-third within a few years. And we will use A-bombs in Korea if war threatens again. Now, this very drastic change in policy and the possible danger of starting touching off a worldwide atomic war naturally caused some doubts in the minds of the Democrats and will be one of the most important questions to be debated in Congress. Now, the first item to come before Congress will be the St. Lawrence Waterway. And a secret poll of senators shows that it lacks six votes of passing. However, there are 12 votes still undecided and uncounted. And upon those 12 senators will depend upon whether this famous and much debated waterway finally comes to pass. Now, in general regarding Congress, the old guard Republicans are grousing because Eisenhower has drifted to the left. However, the they'll probably have to go along with their own president. And the latest wisecrack in Capitol cloakrooms is that Ike has become so New Dealish that he will defeat the Republicans and get reelected. Now on the foreign affairs front, the most important unpublished news is our efforts to get back 936 American prisoners held in violation of the truce. Most people have forgotten them. We're paying attention to the 22 Americans who don't want to come back, but these 936 Americans are held illegally. And we're making terrific efforts to get them back. I can't reveal what we're doing, and you wouldn't want me to, but we are. I'll be back in just a minute with an interview with an old friend of ours who may surprise you because he hasn't exactly been known as a friend of mine, namely Harry Truman, former President of the United States. Mr. President, a lot of people have been criticizing me because I've sometimes been critical of McCarthy. They say that McCarthy, despite his methods, is necessary to this country in order to focus attention on communism and put communists in jail. What's your opinion of that? Well, I don't think the methods of McCarthy are ever necessary in a republic such as ours. The Bill of Rights is the basis of the freedom of the individual. And his uh, idea of an approach is by suspicion and not by the facts. The facts in the case are that the communists who were working for the subversion of the government of the United States were indicted long before McCarthy ever heard of a communist. And they were indicted during the administration of President Roosevelt and myself. That's uh, something which most people either have forgotten or rather fuzzy about. Could you uh, document that a little bit? Well, there were the communist trials in New York under Judge Medina, who was an appointee of mine, and the district attorney was an appointee of mine. There were communists indicted in various states around over the country uh, by the grand juries called by the judges in those districts and the evidence furnished by the district attorneys in those districts, all of whom had been appointed either by me or President Roosevelt. And all the communist convictions and all the communist indictments were carried out during the administration of President Roosevelt and President Truman. Well, that is something which most people have really forgotten. Uh, has there been any communist indicted or prosecuted or convicted under the new administration that you know of? I've never heard of it. If, that's, if there has been, it's been in secret and not in public. I'm sure it would have been in secret. <laughs> Well, tell me another thing. The investigation, as I recall it, of the 12 top communists who were later convicted began, uh, when, uh, when was that roughly, 47, 48? 
Yes, it was in uh, my first administration. I don't remember the exact date. Well, Mr. McCarthy made his first speech, I remembered rather vividly, because uh, uh, I think his first speech was in, on Lincoln's birthday in Wheeling, West Virginia, on February the 12th, 1951. Now, do you remember when Alger Hiss was first indicted, roughly? At least a year or two before that. By, uh, by your administration? Yes, indeed. Well, well, what was the... There's been a lot of talk about you saying that the Alger Hiss indictment was a red herring. What is the fact on that? Well, the facts in the case are that at a press conference one morning, some young man who'd never been at a, con a press conference before during a session of the 80th Congress uh, asked me if the actions of the Un-American Activities Committee was not in the form of a red herring to cover up what the Republican administration in the 80th Congress had not done. And I said it might be. And no. that's where it started. In other words, I never made any statement that there was a red herring, although the Republicans, when they're in power, always try to cover up their mistakes by attacking somebody or some institution. And so you e never even used the word red herring. No. That was the word that used by the reporter, and you said, well, it might be that the Congress was trying to cover up something. That's right. Mr. President, I've been looking around your office and all these history books, and I know that you've been working on history. I'd like to ask, as a historian, which political party, if either one, has done the most to weed out subversives, in your opinion? Well, I don't want to pose as a historian, although I've been a student of history all my life, but as nearly as I can discover, the laws against subversion and espionage were passed in the administrations of Woodrow Wilson, Franklin Roosevelt, and Harry S. Truman. And those I've never heard of any being passed in the Republicans' 12 years in office between uh, Wilson and Roosevelt. As those laws we're operating on today. Those are the laws that we operate under today. Do you recall roughly how many people were, uh, were dismissed from office or discouraged from taking office in uh, your administration by your loyalty program? Well, I have a memorandum here which uh, shows that 490 people were di dismissed on loyalty grounds and some 6,400 were dismissed or denied employment or resigned or due application for employment because they were security risks, not necessarily because they were disloyal. But the 490 were discharged because it appeared that they were risks and they're really disloyal. All these people were handled in a way so that if they were innocent, they were not smeared. And that was the difficulty that I had in setting up the loyalty boards as President of the United States. I wanted to be sure that the rights of the individual were protected and that the individuals were not smeared, that they understood who was accusing them of their difficulties, that they understood thoroughly why they were being dismissed if they were dismissed, and they were not smeared by hearsay, as is the policy of uh, some of the successors of uh, President Truman and all. Mr. President, as I recall, that began in 1947, which was three to four years before McCarthy made his first speech. That's correct. Thank you very That's much correct. indeed. You're welcome. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Fred Utell. As you all know, Mr. Pearson, for many years, has made a specialty of getting the news early and accurately. The real inside news about what goes on in Washington, throughout America, in the world. But there's one thing I didn't know until the other day that Mr. Pearson writes a special newsletter from Washington, D.C. every week containing all this valuable information. Up to now, only a few thousand selected people have been able to receive this exclusive personal service. But I spoke to Mr. Pearson and said, I'd like to get this letter too, and so would a great many of his television friends. Now you too can get Mr. Pearson's current weekly letter and complete information of a special introductory offer so that you may get this letter every week. And here's all you have to do. Mail one dollar with your name and address to Drew Pearson, Box 1313, Washington, D.C. Drew Pearson's column can be read daily in the New York Mirror. Now a prediction on the most important economic story of the year, taxes. I have here a letter written by Congressman Reed of New York, the tax writing czar of Congress. It's a confidential letter, and don't ask me how I got it, but it was written to his members of his committee who helped to write the taxes. It's very important. It contains 
two uh, vital things. One is that the tax laws of the United States are to be completely revised. Reed proposes this right now. Secondly, he's depending entirely upon big business advisors. He's not depending or called in any advisors from farmers, housewives, or uh, labor groups. Now, Uncle Dan Reed proposes this as a monument to Uncle Dan Reed. He is so anxious that this be his monument that he hasn't taken very much advice from the Treasury and he spurned the invitation of the President of the United States to come down to the White House and confer on taxes. Instead, he went off to Panama. So, here is my prediction as to what will happen. The tax laws do need revising, but in general, I predict that under this, this new revision, the tax burden will be shifted to the lower brackets. And I also predict that because Uncle Dan is so jealous of his own authorship and will not confer very much with other people, that the tax lawyers will make a lot of money unsnarling the complications of the new bill for years to come. Now a prediction on the most vital problem facing this country in Korea, namely the 22,000 Chinese and North Korean prisoners who don't want to go back home. They're supposed to be released under the truce terms on January the 22nd, but the Reds have warned that if they are released, there may be war. They've told this to the Indian guards, and the Indian guards are jittery and worried. However, here is my prediction. I predict that the Reds are bluffing. I predict that we will release those prisoners on January the 22nd and not one minute later. And incidentally, one reason I make that prediction is that Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek has already been ordered to have boats at Inchon ready to take those prisoners to Formosa. Now, ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, I have sent this telegram to Senator McCarthy. Since your name came in for some criticism in an interview with former President Harry Truman on my television program, I should be delighted to give you equal time to reply on the same program. That, I might add, is a better break than Senator McCarthy ever gave me. But I believe it's in the interest of fair play and making democracy live.